to order. First, we'll have the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brett, lead us in prayer, please. Please pray, pray with me. Father, we ask for all of your blessings each and every day. Please be with our Board of Education, teachers, staff, and students as we all work together for a brighter future. We thank you for the beautiful December weather. With Christmas season upon us, help us all to keep, in the, keep the meaning of Christmas close to our hearts. It was the sacrifices made and the unconditional love that told the true story of who we are and to all of us here. Please take care of those who struggle with this time of year. It's supposed to be a happy and thankful time filled with family and friends coming together to celebrate and give thanks. Unfortunately, it is also a time of sorrow for those who do not have family and friends, a warm place to live, or a little food to eat. We must keep them in our prayers and help them when we can and be truly thankful for our blessings. Please be with our men and women of the armed forces as they fight to protect us here and abroad. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Roll call. Dr. Kincaid. Here. Mr. Newsom. Here. Mr. Riley. Here. Mrs. Truth. Present. Mrs. Emersheet. Here. This time we'll have recognition of the Employee of the Month and Friends of Education. The first is the Certified Employee of the Month, Heather Smith, West Middle school math teacher. Uh, my name is Trenton Merner. I'm the principal at West Middle School and I have the privilege of honoring Miss Smith, uh, the PCPS Board of Education Certified Employee of the Month for December is Miss Heather Smith. She is described to as the glue that holds the math department together. Heather embodies every part of a teacher with her knowledge of the curriculum, organization of materials, and the love of her students. She organizes our math standards in accelerated math, constructs learning rubrics for our new standards, helps plan and revise our curriculum maps, and is always sharing new resources to help us teach. She is constantly going over and uh, going over and, uh, and beyond what is expected to help our PLC be successful and create uh, wonderful learning opportunities for our students by sharing lesson ideas. She is a very caring and giving person. If she knows someone that is in need, she will do everything possible to help our colleague or student out. Heather is seen as one of our outstanding tech gurus in the building uh, and helps staff and students incorporate new ideas into their classroom. She is an integral part of our school's student recognition program. Heather is very generous with her time and has been an incredible mentor to other teachers, not only in the math department, but also with the Engage to Learn teachers as well. She is described as being not just a coworker, but also a friend to, uh, to all, and her positivity and, encour and encouragement is contagious. She is also, uh, she is al always giving to, uh, staff messages of encouragement. One teacher said she pushes me to be the best I can be. Her positive attitude helps me enjoy my job more than I ever have or ever would without her. And the best testament uh, is from one of her students who says, Miss Smith makes learning fun and makes me want to share uh, and be here all the time. Congratulations, Miss Smith. We're so glad to have you at West and at Park City Public Schools. Thank you. The next is the Support Employee of the Month, Sally Tubbs, Ponca City High School Job Coach, Career Exploration Coordinator. I'm Thad Dilbeck, the principal at Ponca City High School. Sally goes above and beyond to make sure the students in the Career Exploration Program have the resources they need to gain employment and independent living skills. Along with her many other duties, Sally also supports our students by overseeing the clothes closet, coat closet, prom closet, <laughs> and assists with the food pantry program at Poe High. 
Sally spends many hours working to improve and facilitate the well-being and success of Punk City High School students. She greatly deserves recognition for her efforts. Punk City High School is proud to have Sally Tubbs as Support Employee of the Month for the month of December. The last is Friends of Education, Evan and Associates Enterprise, which is Lincoln's Elementary Pie Partner. Hi, I'm Liz Hargraves, Principal Lincoln Elementary, and I am very proud to give Karen Hollick, who is representing Evans and Associates, the Friend of Education Award tonight. Lincoln Elementary would like to nominate Evans and, Evans and Associates for Friend of Education. They have been our pie partner for years and do a fantastic job. Evans really goes above and beyond in seeing to the needs of every, everyone at Lincoln. When the Apples for Teachers program was stopped a few years ago, they voluntarily picked it up and allowed our teachers to choose items they need and generously, generously purchase them for the classrooms. They also provide meals for parent-teacher conference evenings, enabling the teachers to eat before 8 p.m. And at Christmas time, Santa visits each classroom and brings a small gift for every child. And they're coming next Monday, Tuesday. Evans put the walking track in for us quite a few years ago, and since then they have resurfaced it to, so it is safe and without cracks and breaks. And at the end of each year, they purchase a bicycle to be used for a drawing for students who have perfect attendance. Evans is continually looking for ways they can help the staff and students at Lincoln. We are so blessed to have them as a pie partner. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> you all that just got your awards now, they'll take you out in the hall and get you a picture. <laughs> It'll be on our website and Facebook, so <coughs> thanks for coming. Congratulations. Bye, Karen. Yes. <laughs> you just realized it's Karen's last name. <laughs> Molly. Gosh, so, God bless you. That's very new. No. No. This time we'll have the uh, presentation of the London, Paris, and we, oh, wait, we got oh, I'm sorry. Recognition of somebody great over there. Yeah. I want to recognize Alex. Alex Lynn. Alex, if you'll stand up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stand right over here in front of the door because I want the board to be able to see you, and then I want the audience to be able to see you too. Alex, come on over here. Alex is one of our phenomenal <laughs> sophomores. We have several phenomenal students and some more right here in the audience. But Alex is our student that scored a perfect 36 on the ACT when he was a freshman and was 14 years old. Are you 15 now, right, Alex? Yes. Awesome. Um, the National ACT Organization told us that in the last decade, only four freshmen have scored that perfect score on the ACT and it's like one-tenth of one percent of everyone who takes it who will score that score. And just to give you a little background about Alex, um, he's on the robotics team, he's on the academic team, he's on the swim team, you name it, he's on it. He's well-rounded and he is quite an expert pianist. I heard him play during mm -hmm. Panic, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Haven't you won like four state championships? Yes. Three at the senior level, and then one at the musically wow. advanced level. So you can see that everything he does is exemplary. And you're a junior karate black belt holder? Yes. Okay, so don't mess with Alex. <laughs> so Alex, you, you are, we're so proud of you. The district is super proud of you. We want to present you with a certificate of recognition. I wish it were a million dollars, but it's not. So, but we, we appreciate all you do. And I want you to tell the board what your aspirations and future plans are. All right, so um, I'm out to sleep. And, uh, all right, so uh, my future aspirations uh, I'm planning to at least apply for MIT and uh, to study biomedical engineering, and I just want to, you know, help society progress.
progress, and I think that's the best way for me to do it. And uh, you know, if I don't go into that research field, I will become a surgeon. Wow. I'm sure you Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your work habits, your study ethics, things oh, like that. Really? Because obviously you're gifted to start <laughs> with. But I took the ACT twice and I made a 36 when I added them together. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, tell us a little bit about, I mean, how much homework do you do? Uh, a fair bit. Most of it, I would say, is actually, I don't think I have too much homework. Most of it is actually in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Congratulations. Thank you. Alex, this is Judy Troop, board member. I've heard you play the piano, and you are wonderful. Thank you. Rhapsody I've in heard Blue, him over Beethoven. Beethoven. For quite a few years. Jan Miller, our, our minutes clerk. He's our board president. Uh, Don Newsom, board member. Great swimmer, I hear. Thank you. That's good. I'm going to try to absorb everything by handshake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, board member. Alex, we're super proud of you. You represent us well, and we wish you all the best of luck. He's a lifelong Ponca City resident, went to Lutheran to elementary school, and he's been with us since he's been at Po High, and we're glad to have you. Thanks so much. Congratulations. Good job, buddy. Good job. This time we'll have presentation of the London, Paris, and Madrid educational field trip proposal. Thank you. Thank you. You got excited about getting. You won all these, didn't you? Awesome. You Yes, he is ill today, so he's not here. So yes, it, he has. It's in the contract folder. So that contract. You're good. I, we talked that time. You're good. We're good. What class is this? This is the English and then. This is the third trip that I have presented to you. Um, in the last probably two months, I've had several students come to me asking me if there's going to be another trip. And so I think that there is um, a lot of interest at Pohai in our school community for travel. This trip is different from the other two in that it includes Paris and Madrid, which would take into um, the realm our foreign language classes, French and Spanish that we have at Pohai as well as London, which um, does incorporate, of course, English, but as well our senior literature and curriculum. And so you can see the itinerary does include um, beginning in London and ending in Madrid. I um, think back, sadly, at the, all the hours of college French that I had and what little I have left, and I had no place to practice. And so I think um, a chance to have real life experiences and practicing the languages that they're learn learning at, at OI, um, English as well as French and Spanish would be a wonderful opportunity. The trips that we've taken in the past have included um, parents and grandparents and board members and community mm -hmm. members <laughs> and um, have been really well received. Um, with Christmas and the Christmas break, I think there are opportunities for students to um, not only sign up, but work and help their families if this is something that they want to do, to try to raise money and, um, and go on this trip. Of course, with summer, they have more opportunities to, you know, get a job and be responsible and help. Um, Explore also offers some really phenomenal early bird, they call it, discounts for students who can sign up early. And plus, I think um, as soon as they can get signed up, it's probably a lot easier for parents and students to budget how they will make this happen if they want to make it happen. You can see on the handout that, it, that the price um, includes virtually everything except for lunch. Um, and of course, that souvenir t shirt, don't forget the magnet. And um, they do have to have it, a current passport. I remember when my two children went to Trout Elementary School and Becky Kruger took them to Washington, D.C. with her class. And they um, were not only so excited and worked so hard to get to go, but it was such a wonderful experience for them. Um, since then, I did four trips through the library, uh, kind of a
literature-based travel thing through the American Girl book series mm -hmm. and took mothers and daughters and grandmothers to um, Chicago four times, even after my daughter was past that age. She never get past American Girl age. But um, just that experience of getting to travel, I think, is something that um, is amazing to get to go other places and see other places and experience other things outside of our town. So it requires no commitment of money from you. I'm simply presenting it to you and asking you for the permission to proceed. So. What do you expect for how many numbers do you think you would have? How many students? Yeah, with students or parents or? Um, well, it's hard to guess. The first time we took a trip, we had um, 32. And um, the second time, we're at about 16. So I think it just depends on I don't know. I think a lot of different factors. Mm -hmm. And they had plenty of chaperones for the students. They weren't. There wasn't a, a lot of correct. There wasn't a lot of students per chaperone. You've had a good group, so there wasn't. You know what I mean for supervision the purposes. First trip, there were more students who traveled without parents. The second trip, there were more students who did have parents or grandparents who traveled with them. So I think we've seen kind of both scenarios. So. If it's the economy, or if it's funding, or financing, or timing, or exactly what it might be, but we've seen it both ways. So, and Judy's been on the yeah. before, and she can tell you it's yeah. It's, it's nice. It's organized. You know, the kids are good. We didn't have any. The only problem we had was my roommate got her purse stolen. She was an adult. And we <laughs> still, she was an adult, and we still don't know how it happened, but it happened. But that was the only incident. And that one had didn't have anything to do with the student. Our students are wonderful. Yeah, yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. They are. Good. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Betsy Easley, Po High Student Council. All right, uh, hi, my name is Max Jackson. I'm a senior at Poe High and I'm current, currently the student council president. I'm gonna quickly introduce some of the, some of the people we brought with us. Uh, this is Case Anderson. He's our uh, Poe High vice president. This is Morgan Didlake. She's our treasurer this year. We're missing two members of our officer team tonight. Uh, Carly James, she's our uh, secretary. She's currently at UCO, actually touring the college. And then uh, Austin Payne, he's our uh, historian and he's in an orchestra concert tonight. So both of them couldn't make it. So before I kind of get into what we do here, uh, Mr. Delbuck, can you come up here, please? We have an award to present. So um, every year, uh, the OASC, which is the Oklahoma Association, Association of Student Councils, holds a state convention. At the state convention, they recognize some of the outstanding student councils throughout Oklahoma. And several student councils receive the, uh, the uh, Gold Chapter Award. And receiving this award, you have to be, o be very active in the lo at your local, state, and national level. And Pohai is only, we're only one of the three schools in our district, we're in District 5, to actually receive this, war re receive this award this year. And we have been a gold chapter school every year since 1990. So. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hand this off to Morgan really quick. Okay, so 2017 is the 50th anniversary of the Pohai Luminaries. Um, Mr. Paul Ingersoll, a longtime Pohai teacher, counselor, assistant principal, and the student council advisor, started the tradition of decorating the front lawn of the high school in 1967. The student council has marked the Christmas season with the luminaries ever since. And we would like to invite you to drive by the front lawn of the high school on Overbrook this Wednesday from 6 to 9 p.m. to enjoy the lights. My throat's a little sore, so please bear with me. <clears throat> so one of our newest projects that we've added to our list of projects that we do every year is a philanthropy week. And uh, we've named it Wild Week. And it stands for Wildcats Impacting Lives Directly. So it's a, it's a week-long event. And we have different events throughout the week that help raise money to donate to our uh, local community, uh, local United Way organizations. And this year we have chosen the Big Brothers Big Sister program. 
And uh, so out throughout this week, we have a bunch of fun things for the students to come and get involved. Uh, dodgeball tournaments, volleyball tournaments, and then on Saturday, at the end of the week, we have a 5K color run open to the community. And that was last year. This year, we've kind of expanded a little bit. So we're having a fine arts night, and uh, we're partnering up with the fine arts department, and we're the jazz band is going to perform that night, and then also we're going to have a uh, silent auction for students to enter in artwork or photography, anything that they deem artistic, and we're going to have silent auctions, and we're going to donate that to the, Miss Easley was saying something, <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to donate that back to the account. So it's a, it's a lot of fun, and it's for a great cause, and I'm pretty passionate about it, and everybody else is, in student council is very passionate about it. This year, our goal is to raise $10,000, so we're hoping we're, it's going to do great this year. Yeah. Hopefully after we're gone, people like Morgan and the generations after us will kind of take it and run with it and see what they can do. With it. Uh, what they can do with it. All right, uh, so thanks for letting us come and talk to you guys tonight. We'd like to say thank you to our site administration for all the support they give, it, give the council and the student body, and uh, Mr. Dilbeck and all the assistant principals, as they are always so encouraging and encouraging everything we do. They're always uh, there to listen to us when we have new ideas, and they'll give us constructive criticism. Cr cr criticism. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're very excited about working with Ms. Eric and developing a closer relationship with the superintendent and the Board of Education. If we can ever do anything to help you guys, don't hesitate to contact me or any of us or Ms. Easley. Good job. I'll have to say they will help out at a moment's notice. These kids are phenomenal, and so is their sponsor. All I have to do is email Ms. Easley. They've been helping with the Spirit Nights, and they're coming back even tomorrow night for Roosevelt Spirit Night, and they did excellent with the Garfield kids. And I said, please come back next time, and they said they would. So thanks for all you do. Betsy, how old is Paul? In 1961, he took chair on the state student council convention. Really? In 61, yeah. Um, the National, uh, the Oklahoma Association of Student Council started um, an award. Um, I don't even know what year it started, but Paul Ingersoll was the first recipient of the State Advisor of the Year Award. So, Ohio is a long time standing student council. You guys do a great job, Betsy. I know how hard you work. Thanks. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. All of you. <laughs> At this time, we're going to uh, vote to recess regular board meeting and call a public hearing for the tribal leaders and Native, Native American parents to discuss the participation of Native American students in education programs comment on educational programs and review proposed changes to section 25 the board policy native american community relations a, co a copy of the provision revisions are included in your handouts I need, a I need a motion for that please so move i have a motion made do i have a second i'll second any discussion then we'll vote. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Troop? Aye. Mrs. Zimmersheed? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Good evening. It's that time of year again when we um, discuss impact aid. Um, because we count Native American students in our impact aid count, we have to have a public hearing each year. And during that hearing, um, we give information out about student participation, Native American student participation in extracurriculars and any other um, activities they may be involved in in school, just to see if they have an equal opportunity to participate in these things. So what I put together each year is just I go through and run the rosters for each one of these sports and extracurricular activities 
and then I um, cross track it against uh, my list of Native American students in Title VI, and then I come up with a number of students who are participating in each one of these activities. Um, they're represented in nearly every one of them, well, in all of them, actually. Uh, some of them just minimal with one person in tennis and one person in girls' tennis, one, one swimmer. Um, but, you know, 26 footballers, I mean, you can read it yourself. But it's a good representation, and the reason why I say that is if you go to the bottom, there's 999 slots, and of those, 189 is Native Americans. So that makes 18.91%. And if you um, look at the Native American kids in 9 through 12, um, as a percentage of the total population, it's 18.16. So it represents what the population is in the school. And I threw at the bottom there, a gifted and talented, and that's district-wide. We have 104 Native American students in the gifted and talented program. Any question about the numbers or? And it's like anything in, in high school or whatever. If um, the opportunity is there, but for some students it's transportation, some students it's um, you know funding. I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, participate even if you're non-native. But the opportunity is there, and we do have kids that do participate. And I brought some information also, the second page, just uh, as a history of impact aid, because um, we never really cover like how much money we've received in the past. So I went back a few years, and in FY 2014, you got a student count, how many kids we counted for our application. And um, 14, 15, and 16, those are final allocation amounts. Those are already been paid off. It takes a couple years to get all of our funding, usually two or three years out. Um, but you can see the amount that we received for each um, fiscal year, 61 back in 2014. It kind of bumped up to 70,000 the next year, but it's progressively getting smaller now. Um, the funding has been flat for a while, and uh, as expenses go up, it just seems like um, there's not enough money or not the same amount of money as, as in the past. And they're not even able, well, we've talked about it before, this program is not fully funded, so they kick in a, a thing called a lot, which is a learning opportunity threshold. It's a prorated amount. And um, now they're getting to where they don't even have enough money to pay off that. So if you look at um, FY 2015, that amount is not even 100% of our lot. It's like 93% of our lot. So they didn't even have enough money to pay the prorated amount. So and it's getting worse. It's not going to get better unless they allocate more, and it doesn't look like Congress is going to do anything like that. So that's just for your information. And this year, um, working on applications it's due in January 31. Uh, we have 167 kids right now. I did a preliminary count. That's for three different tables. 110 of the kids are living on Indian land, and 57 of them live here in low rent housing in town. So, and we barely make enough to even receive this funding. You have to have at least um, 1,000 kids that are federally impacted in your district or 3% of your student population, and we're just barely over 3%. Any questions about anything? How's that funding dispersed? Um, they send it, it directly to um, the schools. It goes to Brenda. Um, usually, like I said, there's initial payment, and it's a, just a portion of your allocated amount or the amount you're going to get, and then they make an interim payment and then a final payment. It usually takes a couple of years. There's no rhyme or reason to when it comes. I mean, it's when the money, when they have it, and they kind of disperse it amongst all the people who receive impact aid funds. What's it used? To, how's it used? Oh, the district here can use it any way they like, and it goes into the general fund. Okay. And it you know pays for gasoline, bus, electricity, whatever you need it for. I mean, once it's in the general fund, it's, you can't track it. And that's what that program is meant to do. Because it started in the 50s, um, influx of military students coming into districts. And they were living on um, properties that did not tax. So they were um, educating the kids, but with no money to do that. So that's when this program came about. And they added Native American lands later on. Because those are also federally impacted. You don't collect school tax on those lands. And it's, it's kind of confusing sometimes. People understand it's not an Indian program. Um, like, say, we had a house in, in White Eagle, 
if someone adopted a Chinese person, a Mexican person, a black person, we could still count all three because of the property is on Indian land. It's not the kid's race, it's where they live. And so that's what this program is for, to help you recoup some of the tax dollars you don't realize because of federal um, regulations. Okay. And then another thing happened, this, um, this one she here in July, at the end of July, I got a letter it was about our IPPs. And when you have Indian kids and you count them, you have to have a policies and procedures in your um, board policy that addresses how you communicate with them, um, the parents, and what, what you need to share with them and how to do that. Um, they said our IPPs were, um, what did they say? They did not meet the new regulatory requirements. So they're going to have to be rewritten or we would not receive funding if we sent the same IPPs that we have now. We don't call them IPPs. I think they're called Native American Community Relations. Okay. Indian so policies and procedures. Yeah, so I enrolled in a webinar to learn more about it, and it came up on towards the end of September, and then I drafted new IPPs based on their recommendations. I think I provided a copy to um, Ms. Errett, and then I gave a copy to um, the business committee the Ponca Tribal Business Committee. And that's another new thing too, a lot of our title programs, well all of them I believe, we have to um, participate in tribal consultation with the tribe that's in this area. So we have to run everything by them now. I think last year was the first year we were required to do that, but that's this too. And so I gave them a copy of that, and then um, I met with them on the 7th, and then I came back and talked to them again on the 13th just to make a presentation of the new IPPs and if they had any questions or concerns to, uh, you know, address those as well. And then I met with them. Well, I didn't meet with them. I set up a final meeting November 30th, and I think Ms. Eric went to that. And Barbara and I went. Yeah, okay. And I followed up last Friday and see, just to make sure they have any more questions or concerns because I told them we were going to be voting on it or you guys were going to be voting on it tonight. And they seemed to be okay with it and no problems. At that point, it was last Friday. And um, I don't know if you want me to go over this now or not. I just made a summary. I know you guys have the full, mm -hmm. the full one, but this is just, well, you have this too. Just kind of a real layman's term, real easy to understand um, of what these policies are, six policies. It's basically just um, talking about what we need to provide and then the timelines for how we provide those and also uh, the method of dissemination of the information. Um, a lot of these practices we were already um, yeah. practicing, but this just puts it in board policy now. It's yeah, I required. think the, the verbiage is a little bit different. I think they're, what they're trying to do is just kind of make everybody Standard more access. uniform across the, <clears throat> across the board. Or it makes it easier for them to, to look at their applications. But I'll entertain any, any other questions if anybody has. Some or if you come up with some before you get to the vote, I know we're going to get there later. And I'll still be here. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, later on, it, on yeah. the agenda. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we're, so we're in a public meeting, so we'll have to yeah. go back into the board Thanks, meeting Chris. and vote later. You're welcome. Okay. We're going to vote Chris. to return to regular meeting now, so we'll need a motion. I'll make a motion to return to the regular board Motion's meeting. Motion's been made. A second? I'll second it. Okay. We'll vote. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. True? Aye. Mrs. Emerson? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Lugo? Fine. 5-1, Building Assessment Review. Liz Hargrave, Lincoln, and Lori Cox, Garfield. Please. screens oh I was just waiting for it to come up okay there it comes okay all right and I do have one type on the first page so just don't look at it <laughs> all right I'm Liz Hargraves principal at Lincoln Elementary this is my fourth year there as principal I started out with some facts we're the highest poverty school in Ponca City at 97 percent free and reduced lunch we are the largest elementary in Ponca City. Our current enrollment, there's the typo, is 436. 
Um, I just made a graph of our groups. We have about 36% white, 3% black, 2% Pacific Islander, 26% Native American, 19% Hispanic, and 14% two or more races. Whoopsie. Okay, Brett. Oh, there, I got it. Forget it. Sorry. <laughs> okay, got it. Lincoln, um, our spring data test results is next. So I made some slides, and on each slide, I just gave a little bit of information about what we saw in our last year's test scores, which, you know, in the state of Oklahoma, they weren't really any good anywhere. But uh, our third grade ranked last out of our seven elementary schools in Ponca City in both ELA and math. Um, so Lincoln is in green, and the district average is in purple, and the state average is in yellow for third grade. In the fourth grade, our reading ELA ranked sixth out of the seven elementary schools, and our math ranked second, woohoo, out of all the elementary schools. So which was 44% and the state average was 41, and the district average was 41. Our fifth grade in ELA ranked, fi ranked fifth out of, the five, or out of the seven elementary schools. In um, reading, let's see, we were at 35%. In math, we ranked fourth in the fifth grade, and it was at 44%, which was above the state average. And in science, we ranked sixth out of the seven schools which were, it was 30%, and uh, the state average and district average was 44. So our, our vision at Lincoln, something that we are working on this year that we are implementing is that all students are engaged learners who are using each other for learning through student-led discussions. Um, that's the direction that we're going. How are we gonna do that? Our goals are every student is gonna grow two years in reading and math according to STAR. That's our school-wide goal for kindergarten through five. We have Kagan structures um, in every single classroom. Uh, my uh, instructional coach is highly trained in Kagan. And also, I'm bringing in a Kagan presenter for the months of professional development for the whole staff for the months of uh, April and May. They're coming two, for two days. Um, our teachers are moving toward effective student-led discussions. And, you know, basically that's just having dialogue with a purpose, where the kids are doing the talking and they're doing the learning from each other. Um, one thing that state tests are going to now is students have to refer to the text for evidence. They have to constantly find, find the evidence in the text to answer questions. It, it's kind of like what they've been doing for many, many years, but much more difficult on a, a much higher level. Um, and teachers are the facilitators and the students are actively participating. These goal, all of these goals ensure that there's much more rigor in the classroom. So what have we accomplished this year? Have some more graphs. Uh, Lincoln students, according to STAR reading, we take a STAR reading test, which is a, a benchmark test on the computer, grades K through five, the first five days of every month. So on here I have September, October, November, and I'll show you some things from December pretty soon. Um, but our, uh, let's see, this is reading. Uh, the green is second grade, and so we'll just take one grade at a time. They started in the school year, uh, second grade at 34th percent, and that's 34% who are proficient. Proficient is when they score at the 50th percentile or above. And so they went from 34 to 40%, and then in November up to 49% proficient. In thir our third grade in readings in September at the beginning of the school year, where 31% of those kids were proficient in reading. In October, they went up to 39% of them proficient. In November, up to 54% 54, 54 of them being proficient. Fourth grade, they started at 30%. Oh, I got to hurry. <laughs> from 30 to 51 to 50. In fifth grade, from 27 to 41 to 44. So we are showing growth every month. We got to show a lot more. 
but we're halfway through the year. I hope we can double those by the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, same in math, and I'll just, math is a lot higher. Um, I don't know if we have really strong math teachers, but math, math teachers. is good. Math is going good. Um, just look at the, you know, uh, well, let's, we'll just look at November. We range from, from first, first grade to uh, fifth grade from 61 to 73% proficient. I just gave you a sample of how we track these scores. This is one class. I took all the names off of a kindergarten class. The green numbers or the ones that are in green were kids who are proficient. You know, the yellow and the reds, they're kids who struggled. And if you look now, they are all turning green. In the, the same way, this is a fifth grade class. Just an example. Every teacher keeps one of these sheets and we meet every month and talk about where our kids are going in PLCs. Oops, that was just another one. Our star growth, this is just another chart of our math and our reading for the whole year. So like for example, first grade, 62% were proficient in reading, I mean, sorry, math. Uh, and now in December, 69 are proficient, so they increased 7%. Our second grade increased 20%. Our third grade has had a 22 percentile increase. Our fourth grade, 24, and our fifth grade, 5. I put in fifth grade in parentheses, 42% of those 69% were above the 75th percentile in math. So that's outstanding. Oh, my timer. Okay, in the very bottom, I'll finish real quick. Kindergarten, they have raised in reading up 20%. First grade, 5%. Second, 16. Third, 21. And fourth, 17. And fifth, 3%. I put fifth out with the side of that in December. 15 kids are close. They're in like within 5%. They were at the 45th percentile. And from 45 to 49. So if you include those 15 kids, they just need one more little bump and they'll be proficient. So that's why I put that up there. So what are we doing? This is about my last slide. Um, we have RTI, which is reading intervention groups um, that work on specific reading skills that kids are missing for grades K through two. We also do provide RTI for third through fifth, but it looks a lot different than it does for the little kids. For the little kids, the primary grades, we use based on literacy first skills, okay? Um, teachers use close reading and guided reading daily. Um, we progress monitor, so we see where all these kids are in K through two every Friday. We see where, ha, what have they um, accomplished? Do they need to move to another group because they have mastered skills in what they were lacking before? Um, we use Envisions Math. We love our ST Math program that the district got for us last year, or got somebody else to pay for, <laughs> Phillips 66. Um, we use Accelerated Math. We have great math teachers, and our fourth and, fourth and fifth grade are departmentalized. Um, in reading, we use Storytown, which is what our adoption is in Ponca City. Um, we have small group instruction, lots of it, interventions, and close reading. We have goals set. Every kid has goals. Kids set their own goals. Teachers set goals. I set goals. Everybody sets goals all the time. Um, we focus on student-led discussions. And not only do I and teachers track progress, but students track their progress as well. That's the end. I, I, is Math and Visions our, our district book? Yes. Okay. How much was. impact on your numbers does the teacher have? Because without identifying particular ones, there's one grade that looks really good. Yes. Compared to the others. Yes. And I would say that's probably your best teacher. Yes, you, you could say that in a roundabout way. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of it has to do with, um, let's say this year in third grade, I have three phenomenal teachers. That was the grade that I noticed. Well, that's the grade that didn't do well. I mean, la last year, but this year I have three up. fabulous teachers. Yes. Fourth grade teachers impacted those high scores. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And teacher turnover, I think, makes a big difference. And I've had teacher tur turnover in one teacher turnover in third grade, like every year I've been there. And I've had one in fourth every year I've been there. Well, and one in fifth.
questions for Liz? I don't have any more. Thank you. Hey, we're trying. I know you. Can talk. <laughs> you, you they had some. We did a data, a mini data retreat just with administrators, and um, we had the schools color coded by poverty rates, and and for the most part, that's how they scored. But there were several anomalies that did not fit inside that box, and there were several anomalies at Lincoln that outperformed what the norm according to poverty rate was. So they're doing a great job. She's a tough act to follow. <laughs> My shorter, hopefully sweeter. <laughs> so um, I, generalized, I generalized my data a little bit more than Liz did. She went in, she had some great data. Um, I wanted to, to take in, I, I thought it was only fair with getting the reset for that, that OSTP and the, just the way it scored and the bell curve um, and the NAEP scores, I thought, you know, I, I, it is what it is we're gonna do. We're gonna do our best to go forward, but it's unfair to just look at that. So I wanted to look at our star data. It's also nationally normed. Um, and so uh, in third grade, we ended third grade in star uh, ELA with 60% of our third graders being at grade level according to star. 19% with the state's test. Fourth grade, 74% of our kids were at 50th percentile above. That means they're proficient or above. With the state's test, they said 28%. Um, fifth grade, um, STAR said 65%. The state said 27 So we've got two variants there, but I think it's only fair. You know, they're always telling us we know our kids should be judged by more than one test on one day, and we've got two nationally normed tests here. And so um, I think when one is so low, it's only, it's only fair to show another source of data that the district uses that is nationally normed that shows our kids at Garfield are doing much better than what um, the state's scores show. Whoops. Well, whoops, now I gotta go back. Uh, last few. There we go. Here's the star math. And kind of same scenario there. We scored higher in math than what we did um, reading, kind of along the lines of what um, Liz has showed. Um, but third grade, 76% were proficient uh, for star, 21% with OSTP, 74% in fourth grade, 27% with the state test, in fifth grade, 83% and on the OSTP math was 32%. So um, on one nationally normed test, we're showing 78% of our students proficient, and on the other um, newer nationally normed um, one, we've only got 17%. So some pretty diverse data there, depending on what you look at. When were these tests take given? Both at the same time? Um, same time one, the, the STAR test was given one week after the state test. We go right out of the state testing, and as soon as we're through with that, the very next week we start with our end of the year STAR testing. So they were taken within a week of each other. Um, so that was last year to bring us up to speed. This is this year. And um, we do our, the way we do ours is a little bit different than, than what Lincoln does. We take a beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year, which I know Liz and them do, but we progress monitor every two weeks. Um, and then um, when we come back in January, we'll do our middle of the year uh, uh, assessment, and then that's when I'll update this. So this is all from the beginning of the year. Um, we started out with, um, this year, with 45% of our kindergartners um, at or above benchmark. In the blue on watch, those are our kids that are anywhere from just a few months behind to up to a year behind. Or, and they're what they call on watch. So you gotta watch these kids. It's not gonna take too much to bump them up. Um, but they're kind, of, they're kind of what we like to call our bubble kids. Um, they're just right. They're just right there. Um, 
Then in yellow, those are children that are indefinitely in need of intervention, and they scored in the 10 to 24th percentile. Those students are anywhere from about a year to year and a half behind. And then the ones in red that you see, those are children who are in need of intensive intervention. They scored in the bottom 10 percentile, and that means they're two or more years behind. So that takes them a whole lot of growth to catch them up. And if you'll look, when you see all those scores at the end of last year, in the 60s and 70s, this is about where we start every year. This is about where we grow our children from every year. Um, that high poverty schools don't necessarily get the credit for doing that. They, we don't walk in with 60 to 70 percent of our kids being on grade level and being proficient. Um, it takes a lot of hard work and it takes um, a lot of intensive interventions, a lot of focused instruction to get the kids where they need to be. So um, that's for our reading. Um, and I'll just let you look at that. You guys are, because Shelly's telling me I'm almost out of time. Okay, in math, um, STAR does not test kindergartners in math, so that's just uh, first grade uh, through fifth. And if you'll notice, math scores were starting out higher than we did. We were only like 35% proficient in, in the ELA. In the last one, if you notice, 50% of our kids are already proficient starting out um, uh, at the beginning of the year. Our kids don't have the same summer learning loss in math that they do reading. That going home all summer and not reading um, really affects and we really have a lot of learning loss, summer learning loss we have to make up each and every year. This is our data wall and I just hate that it doesn't show up better and I actually printed it off because the slide that I print off from it shows up so good in print because this is shows you what we're doing. Um, our kids all start out in that top tier that you see up there is um, this is where we want all of our kids to be. These are those on-watch kids that start out in blue at the beginning of the year. These are our kids in yellow. These are our intensive kids down here. And we put a name on each slip and we color code it according to how they score. Because um, as kids move up or they move down, we want to lay our hands on those child's name. We are moving a child up or we are moving a child down, not just a number, not just a sticker. And so um, I wish you could see that better and you might be able to see it better on your screen there. But we are moving children up. The red start out in the bottom, the yellow start out in the second to the bottom. But we are moving kids up and they are going forward and that's in reading and then you can really tell in the math they're really moving up. We hardly have any left down here in the bottom tier at all. How, we are, often, are, how hmm. often are parents involved in that? On looking at this, this is our data room for teachers. What kind of kid moves? Is a parent? No, that's for staff during PLCs. That's for the teacher to see and do. So when do they include the parents in discussions on that? During parent, usually during parent-teacher conferences. They don't see the whole wall though. I mean, you talk about, teachers are always in communication with parents about how their child is or is not progressing. Um, but, you know, the thing is that we can't involve the parents in this, so to speak, because this is like confidential for staff, I, uh, staff eyes only because if parents come in, everybody else's kid's name are on those stickers too in there. But so. I understand that, but, but it, how often do you have parent-teacher conferences? District, when the district does twice a year. I mean, so if a kid's doing one of these. No, we're contacting them and, and, and talking to them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Continue to grow and improve. Professional development for teachers is ongoing. We're working real hard on the TQE process in math, and that's learning how to give uh, students a focused task. Um, giving questions, kind of as Liz said, I could have almost said, I could just almost say ditto for what we're doing for what Lincoln's doing, and then having the students show evidence of, um, of how they got their answer. And that's a big thing right now, is them not just giving you the answer, but how did you get that answer? What is your thinking? Because sometimes a, a child can just happen to guess the right answer. So if they don't tell you how they got that answer, you really don't know if they have that evidence there. 
the PLC process, you know, that's that's district wide in, in, in Ponca City and something that we're expected, all expected to do, and that I think we all work really hard at doing. Um, we do instructional rounds with teachers. I've got teachers going and observing each other um, to learn from each other's strengths. Uh, continue to provide teachers with the training and the tools needed to ensure fidelity and the continued implementation of Literacy First Framework. Um, and then just continue to improve our reading interventions in tier two and three. It's not a one and done thing. This is our third year with System 44 reading uh, interventions and um, with Voyager as well. And so um, I think our biggest hurdle to, to get over to and get those reading scores moving like we are in math is, is just the lack of vocabulary in our at-risk students. It's just, we've got to make that up. They're great word callers. They read fluently. They're just not understanding enough of the meanings of the words within the text um, to be able to comprehend at the level that they should. But again, just, you know, like Liz said, I could just say ditto, you know, the close reading, finding the evidence in text, all of that. So... That's it for me. Any questions? Questions for Lori? These scores are bad because they don't have any parent input at home, probably. And it's such a poverty problem, too. I think it is. I, I, it is. I mean, the research will show you that, not just at Garfield or Lincoln, but nationwide it will show you that. Children who come, I can't give you the exact figures off the top of my head, but especially the vocabulary deficit that children start school with um, is so great, and it shows that every year they're in school, you would think that would get smaller, but nationwide it shows every year they're in school, the gap increases and gets larger. Um, and so... It's just, man, we're giving them all the basic technical skills to decode words, to know those sight words. And I've said this to all of you before, you come in any time we're doing MERT, sit down next to any of our children, have them read to you, and you'll go, well, I don't understand where these scores are coming from. This child reads beautifully. Whip out a comprehension <laughs> test and have them read that and answer the questions. And we have fifth graders that don't know the meaning of the word infant. You know, and so you read a whole story about an infant, th they don't get it. And so that, that is our biggest, I, I wished I could figure it out. I'd be, I could be a millionaire if I could figure out how to close the vocabulary gap. Because to me, that's the thing we've got to overcome, not with just Garfield, but all of our high poverty schools in reading, is we've got to be able to close the vocabulary gap. I agree, they can read. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. How's your teacher turnover? Like most high poverty schools, it's every year. This year I have um, three entry year teachers in my building. Two of the entry year teachers are in fourth grade, a testing grade. So out of six that are testing um, on state tests, two of those will be, you know, and they're great. I, I mean, they're doing a good job, but an entry year teacher, even at their best, is an entry year teacher. And so we'll take a hit for that this year. I know we will. They're going to develop into good teachers, but it's hard work. And the, and the thing is, it's, it's much easier to go to a non-high poverty school and teach. And, and you know, you, you send home a word list, you send home stuff, and parents want bragging rights at the soccer field. They're going to do it. They want their kid on the second grade sight word list if they're in first grade. Um, my parents aren't lazy. Some of my parents are working two and three jobs. They're exhausted. They get home. It's all they can do to get baths, get them fed, get them in bed, much less as a single parent get up there and do homework with two or three kids and, and go over sight words. It's a, it is. It's a struggle for them. I'm not going to blame them as far as I think my parents are lazy. I don't think they are. I think they're doing the best they can with what they've got. And a lot of them work nights. I have several that work evening shift at Dorado Foods. Um, they're sleeping during the day when, they're, when their children uh, are in school and when they get, get home, a lot of them have an older sibling that watches them and makes sure all that done and they get in bed. So they have a lot of struggles that my boys didn't have um, to get that done, but that is a hurdle. Okay, thanks Lori. Thank you. <coughs> this time we'll do the consent agenda. We have a motion on that. 
Uh, David, on B, on the consent agenda, we need to include PO number 959 that we just actually found out about today. It's Each board member has a copy. It's to Crow and Dunleavy for our um, miscalculation lawsuit. Now, you can see that the amount of the PO, but we will invoice the uh, schools who are joining in on this suit with us. So we're going to invoice $70,000, so. Wouldn't that be on 7-1 instead of 6-1? You're right, sorry. Okay. 7-1, I apologize. David, it's 7-1-B. So I'll move to approve 6 one, two, and three. Second. You moved and second. Any discussion? Then we'll vote. This is true. This is Zimmer Aye. Ms. Quinn. Aye. Mr. Nixon. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Seven one. Okay, now you know. Oh, now we know about B. <laughs> no, number B, the PO. We move that we approve seven one with the addition. And I'll second it. Then moved and second in discussion. Well, now is it for fifty thousand or seventy? Uh, the POs for fifty, but we're going to be invoicing other districts for seventy thousand. Oh, and, okay. And, and obviously, it's dispersed um, by the portion that you pay. So we've paid our fair share, but there's a bill due now for fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mrs. Zimmershe. Aye. Dr. Kincaid. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mrs. True. Aye. Seven two. Consideration take action on ratification of the AIA contract to employ construction manager Kyler Construction Group Inc. for projects from the 2015 bond issue. Motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve. Second. I'll second it. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, Ross, you're going to get the concert hall in West Middle School on time under budget? We're shooting for. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of steel on that one. Wow. Yeah, it it looks good. I forget how many, how many semi loads, but it, it's a lot. Looks nice. But we are on schedule, of course, you know. Okay. What comes next after the steel? Uh, end of this month, we're going to start some of the exterior framing and the upper deck concrete, some of the mechanical and plumbing rough in, probably some of the electrical rough in. <coughs> if there's anything that needs to be in those upper deck slabs that needs to be punched through that doesn't have a dedicated chase to it. Um, so, end of the month, that, that we're going to have some more activity, some more players on the job. What's the completion in 18? Is that right? August. August of 18. Mm -hmm. Ready for school. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what we're shooting for. Uh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Then we'll vote. Dr. Kincaid. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mrs. True. Aye. Mrs. Zimmersheep. <laughs> Sorry. Aye. <laughs> 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 well, no, right? I, I got me mixed up, up earlier don't too. Sorry. Me over. Seven Sorry. three consideration take action on ratification of the AI contract to employ construction manager Rick Scott Construction Company for projects from the 2015 bond issue. Motion to approve. Seven point three. Second. Second. Discussion. Stephanie, same question to you. <laughs> All going to be in on time under budget. I've heard that before. Pat answer, huh? <laughs> two minutes yeah, ago. Just, yeah, from two rows up. Yeah. <laughs> we'll vote. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mrs. True. Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe. Aye. Dr. Kincaid. Aye. Seven four. Considering taking action on accepting subcontract bid package for the demolishing portion of the project for the West Middle School flooring and restroom remodel project. Motion to approve seven four. This is that extra. Who's doing that? We had to bid on that. <laughs> the one we didn't take, wasn't it? Yeah, we had Correct. to rebid this point. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Right. The work. Jackson wrecking out a unit. Yeah. They did not bid the first go around, but they did bid. A lot better bids this time. We had three bids. We had the two uh, original people that bid it and Jackson. So we had three. 
three bids this time. Good. Any other discussion? Need a second. Need a second. I'll second it. Vote, please. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. True? Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Neeson? Aye. Seven five. Consider and take action to approve the guaranteed maximum price GMP for the West Middle John West Middle School remodel project. Discussion? Motion to approve it. Motion's been made. Second. Any other discussion? We're at one point four million. You okay with that? It's less than the proposed budget and the money available, so yes sir, I do. Then I like it. <laughs> what was the proposed? No, no. no. It's less. Okay. Don't care. What was the proposed? Uh one point five nine five. I've got places for it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll vote. This is true. Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Seven six. Consider and take action on the guaranteed maximum price for the high school football locker room project. I'll move to approve seven six. I'll second. Any discussion? Same question, Brett. Yeah. <laughs> budget, yes, sir. Okay. And what was the original budget? Three point two five. Okay. Yeah. And we're getting a lot of extra money to spend. I know. Oh, boy. <laughs> Take care of it. He's already got it spent. Don's already got it spent. <laughs> All right, we'll vote. Mrs. Zimmershe? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Troop? Aye. 7-7, seven, seven, consider and take action on donating property owned by the Ponca City School Public Schools located east of Attucks Community Center to the city of Ponca City. This uh, particular property is right in the middle of what Attics Community Center owns and the city. The city, and basically it's some tennis courts. Um, I didn't even know that we actually still own that piece of property, but technically we do. The city would like to have that, and you're legally able to just give it to them. They've been maintaining the tennis courts mm -hmm. all these years. But they'd like to apply for some grants to improve them more, but they can't do it without owning it. So mm -hmm. that's what this is all about. We don't really need it. And I believe the city got a grant and they're in process of building a new splash pad right next to these tennis courts. Yeah. I mean, the dirt work's already started oh on an approved project for a right. fourth splash pad. Tennis courts okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's where the basketball goals are. They play oh, basketball. okay, okay. Oh, well, I have a motion to approve. Yeah. I'll make a motion to. We already got it. We've got a motion over here. Oh. A motion has been made. Oh, motion. Motion. Yeah, quietly. Sorry. I, I motion Hi. to approve 7.7. All right. Any other discussion? We'll vote. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Troop? Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe? Aye. 7 8. Consider and take action on Section 2 5 of the Board Policy Native American Community Relations. Motion to approve 7.8. Second. Any discussion? Vote. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Troop? Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. 7-9, consider and take action, action on the following contract agreements. A, the agreement with Stuart Sign for the LED full color display sign. B, agreement with Pinnacle to purchase a replacement server room uninterrupted power supply. C, agreement with Catapult Learning for the Punk City Public School Teachers Training. D, agree, agreement with Exploratory, Exploratory travel of the London, Paris, and Madrid education field trip. E, agreement with sub, Sunbelt staffing to provide speech and language service for students. F, agreement with present learning to provide speech and language service for students. That's it. I make a motion we approve A through F. I second it. Okay, E and F, do we, have we hired two different companies to provide <coughs> speech? Yes, we're struggling to find okay. any one. And we actually have a vacancy that we've had uh, since the beginning of the year. One of our contract uh, SLPAs wasn't fully certified and it was misrepresented to us. And then we are losing one at midterm. So, these are replacing uh, holes that we have, and we're, we're just thankful that we have some real people. We thought we might have to result to teletherapy. Okay. So. And on number A, 
what where's this sign gonna be out front here out in the front yes okay on the brick it said something about okay kind of back behind the install brick. the yeah, sign started. in uh -huh. the house what does that mean the district These old guys well, are gonna do it. oh we're, our guys are gonna okay Tony. okay oh that'll be nice and what what will they just we can scroll any messages, okay. um, any information, any calendar information or anything about our district. And uh, down below, we're going to put like a cutout of the PC logo. Oh. Metal. Okay. Have it painted. Oh. And our address will be on there somewhere because we get a lot of questions about the administration so we'll What is oh. the address? 613 East Grand. 613. We should have that for fire purposes anyway. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Mm -mm. Yes. In finance committee, Jason, we talked about a bunch of Promethean boards. Right. I don't see them on here. Yeah, we talked. About we them talked too. about them as well. But I don't. I don't see them on here to approve. Uh, were they not? Uh, probably the consent agenda. Oh, uh, Consent's under ten thousand because it was like sixty or seventy thousand dollars, wasn't it? No, that was. The no, oh, you had Pat. 80 per, you had like 80 Promethean boards, didn't you? They're not on here then. I didn't see them on here. Could we take that up in new business? It's not a oh, that's right. They're not contracts. We just we just purchased. Oh. It was from the PO. It's on a PO. Oh, okay. We already had the contract. It's not technically it's not a contract. It's basically okay. a purchase question I had on those are those replacements rooms that don't have them or what no basically at this point we have come to a you know we've had created boards and rooms for about over 10 years so the replacements okay what we're going to do is we're going to hit the schools we need to start putting them in our replacement schedule like we do everything else and so what we're going to do is we're going to take those and we're going to hit the schools that we're doing this summer which is four elementary schools and I think we can get about three of those schools completely done right now they're going to come and they'll, they'll install those three schools. We'll take the old boards down. We'll take parts and pieces and move those around and fix problems elsewhere. Okay. And then we'll just start doing about 50 or 75 a year probably. You're not going to store the stuff that's left, are you? No. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the parts I that we need. I thought for parts. Okay. We, we, have, we have a certain parts. amount of parts. Yeah. Mostly the board pieces are actually, we don't really have problems with those. It's projectors. The, the new systems we have don't have projectors. Um, we spend about three or four hundred dollars for a bulb for those, so we're getting rid of those and we're we're dropping that cost of there won't be bulbs there, more like those like the TVs like that one over there type type system. And aren't they cheaper? They're cheaper and they're. From what we originally started buying these things for, they are cheaper than 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 they were. Um, we're buying a slightly smaller, about that size compared to if you go in the west in the other room, that one's a much bigger one. We're going about that size. Yeah. Just. Just cost wise, we just can't afford to spend seven thousand dollars more well, like that one in there. So we're they, going with those. If they do the same thing. Right. It's just they size. Are, they're better. Yeah, it's in the old last longer. Technology. Yeah. So thank you. Any other discussion? Then we'll vote. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Truth? Aye. Mrs. Zimmerty? Aye. Dr. Kincaid? Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Seven ten. Consider and consider and take action on the proposed executive session for the following purpose. Discuss the possible termination, reassignment, resignation, and employment of personnel on the attached detailed personnel report. <clears throat> Discuss confidential conversation with the board's attorney concerning pending claims and litigation and discussion of evaluation of the superintendent of schools during executive session. So I need a motion for executive session. Motion's been Second. made. Second. 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 Vote. This is true. Aye. Mrs. Zimmershe. Aye. Dr. Kincaid. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Okay, we'll adjourn for executive session. Sure. He's sick. He's sick. Oh. <laughs> Do we vote on that? No. Do we vote on that? No. <laughs> okay. Every time. Uh, we sign up with the board president. The minutes of the executive session were kept by the board. Clerk and remain confidential. 713, vote to approve or not approve recommended termination, reassignment, resignation, employment of personnel. Move to approve. Move to approve. Second. Second. Vote. Mrs. Zimmersheed? Yes. 
Dr. Kincaid? Yes. Mr. Newsom? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Mrs. Crute? Aye. New business? No new business. Thank you. Adjournment? Motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good job, guys. Aye, aye, aye. Yes, yes. Judy, I'm Judy. I'm Nancy. I'm everybody. <laughs>